Welcome, everybody. 2021 has just begun. We're in the second month, but award time has come. Literary awards, we have masses of them all around the world. We cannot do videos about everyone. But yesterday I saw a short notice that Disha Filial's novel, The Secret Lives of Church Ladies, which I have read, which I have reviewed on my channel, that this novel is long listed for the 2021 Penn Faulkner Award. So I thought, let's present you the long list of the Penn Faulkner Award 2021. Let's get started. The Penn Faulkner Award was founded in 1980 and was first awarded and handed out in 1981. Um, the reaction, it was a reaction that from a couple of people who thought that the National Book Award was getting more and more commercial. And uh, these people wanted to have sort of an oppositional prize to the National Book Award. Uh, one of the founders uh, is the writer Mary Lee Settle, who actually won the National Book Award in 1978. She's one of the founders of the Penn Faulkner Award. And the Faulkner Award apparently got some leftover money, I think, from the William Faulkner Foundation that was dissolved in the 1970s. The first winner of the Penn Faulkner Award was, in 1981, Walter Abish with his novel How German Is It? I should have read that novel because I'm German, but I haven't done it. Since then, lots of more or less famous authors have won the Penn Faulkner Award. I just uh, want to give you a couple of names here. E.L. Doctorow has won it. Don DeLillo has won it. Philip Roth has won it a couple of times. John Updike, Richard Ford, Anne Patchett. And last year, Chloe Angis, Mexican-American writer, was given the award for her novel Sea Monsters. So let's get to the 2021 long list. Three of the authors on the long list are actually authors that the National Book Award Foundation has once listed as 535. That's the very, very sort of talent show that the National Book Award Foundation does every year by naming five authors under 35 who they think are great talents and great prospects for the future. And the first one is one of them, Kay Min Chang, for her novel, Best Cherry. She is, last year she was mentioned as a 5 under 35 author. She is a Taiwanese American writer and she was a finalist also for um, the Lambda Award. She is nominated for her book, Best Cherry, published by One World on September 29 last year. One evening, mother tells daughter a story about a tiger spirit who lived in a woman's body. She was called Hu Gu Po and she hungered to eat children, especially their toes. Soon afterward, daughter awakes with a tiger tail, and more mysterious events follow. Holes in the backyard spit up letters spent by her grandmother. A visiting aunt arrives with snakes in her belly. A brother tests the possibility of flight. All the while, daughter is falling for Ben, a neighborhood girl with strange powers of her own. As the two young lovers translate the grandmother's letters, daughter begins to understand that each woman in her family embodies a myth and that she will have to bring her family's secrets to light in order to change their destiny. With a poetic voice of crackling electricity, Kei Ming Chang is an explosive young writer who combines the wit and fabulism of Helen Oyeyemi with a subversive storytelling of Maxine Hong Kingston. Tracing one family's history from Taiwan to America, from Arkansas to California, Bastiary is a novel of migration, queer lineages, and girlhood. The second author is a lot, is at the end of her career. I think she wouldn't mind much if I say that. It's Bobby Ann Mason for her novel, Dear Anne, published by HarperCollins on September 8th last year. Bobby Ann Mason is 80 years old. She is, um, I read her a long time ago with her short story collection, Shiloh and Other Stories. I also read her first novel that was called In Country that also became a motion picture film. And now at age 79, she published her novel, Dear Anne. Anne Workman is smart but naive, a misfit who's traveled from rural Kentucky to graduate school in the transformative years of the late 1960s. While Anne fervently seeks higher learning, she wants what all girls yearn for, a boyfriend, but not any boy, 
She wants the real thing, to be in love with someone who loves her equally. Then Jimmy appears as if by magic. Although he comes from a very different place, upper middle class suburban Chicago, he is a misfit too, a rebel who rejects his upbringing and questions everything. Anne and Jimmy bond through music and literature and their own quirkiness, diving headfirst into what seems to be a perfect relationship. But with the Vietnam War looming and the country in turmoil, their future is uncertain. Many years later, Anne recalls this time of innocence and her own obsession with Jimmy as she faces another life crisis. Seeking escape from her problems, she tries to imagine where she might be if she had chosen differently all those years ago. What if she had gone to Stanford University, as her mentor had urged, instead of a small school on the East Coast? Would she have been caught up in the summer of love and its subsequent dark turns? Or would her own good sense have saved her from disaster? Beautifully written and expertly told, Dear Anne, is the wrenching story of one woman's life and the choices she has made. Bobby Ann Mason captures at once the excitement of youth and the nostalgia of age and how consideration of the road not taken, the interplay of memory and imagination can illuminate and perhaps overtake our present. The third author nominated for the Penn Faulkner Award in 2021 is Matthew Salassis, or Matthew Salassis, however you pronounce it, for his novel Disappear, Doppelganger, Disappear. Published by Little A on August 11 last year, Matthew is a Korean-American author. He uh, has written one bestseller, that's his novel The Hundred Year Flood, that shows um, a Korean-American man in his early 20s going to Prague in expectation of the 100-year flood that comes every 100 years to sort of survive it in a different environment. Matt Kim is always tired. He keeps passing out. His cat is dead. His wife and daughter have left him. He's estranged from his adoptive family. People bump into him on the street as if he isn't there. He's pretty sure he's disappearing. His girlfriend Yumi is less convinced. But then she runs into someone who looks exactly like her. And her doppelganger turns out to have dated someone who looks exactly like Matt. Except the other Matt was superior in every way. He was clever, successful generous and beloved, until one day he suddenly and completely vanished without warning. How can Matt Kim protect his existence when a better version of him wasn't able to? Or is his worst life a reason for his survival? Set in a troubling time in which a presidential candidate is endorsed by the KKK and white men in red hats stalk Harvard Square, Disappear Doppelganger Disappear is a haunting and frighteningly funny novel about Asian American stereotypes the desires that make us human, puns in what happens to the self when you have to become someone else to be seen. Rufy Thorpe for The Knockout Queen is nominated. Alfred A. Knopf, published on April 28 in 2020. The Knockout Queen is Rufy's third novel. Her first novel was The Girls from Corona Del Mar in 2014, which uh, I think seems to be a very interesting novel about the development of girls moving from adolescence to adulthood. Uh, we know the story, in a diff it has been written in lots of variations, and this seems to be a very interesting one. Uh, Rufi is living with her husband and her kids in California, and The Knockout Queen is her third novel. Bunny Lampert is the Princess of North Shore, beautiful, tall, blonde, with a rich real estate developer father and a swimming pool in her backyard. Michael, with a ponytail down his back and a septum piercing, lives with his aunt in the cramped stucco cottage next door. When Bunny catches Michael smoking in her yard, he discovers that her life is not as perfect as it seems. At six foot three, Bunny towers over their classmates. Even as she dreams of standing out and competing in the Olympics, She's desperate to fit in, to seem normal, and to get a boyfriend, all while hiding her father's escalating alcoholism. Michael has secrets of his own. At home and at school, Michael pretends to be straight, but at night, he tries to understand himself by meeting men online for anonymous encounters that both thrill and scare him. When Michael falls in love for the first time, a vicious strain of gossip circulates, and a terrible, brutal act becomes the defining feature of both his and Bunny's futures, and of their friendship. With storytelling as intoxicating as its intelligent, Rufy Thorpe has created a tragic and unflinching portrait of identity, a fascinating examination of our struggles to exist in our bodies, and an excruciatingly beautiful story of two humans 
aching for connection. Mother, Daughter, Widow, Wife, published by Scribner on July 7, is the fifth book that is nominated for the Penn Faulkner Award by Robin Wasserman, Wasserman, uh, as we would say in German, but probably Wasserman in English or in, in American English. Robin is 42 years old. She has written already 10 very successful books for young adults, and um, Mother, Daughter, Widow, Wife is her second novel for adults. She is a graduate of Harvard University and the University of California in Los Angeles. Who is Wendy Doe? The woman found on a Peter Pan bus to Philadelphia has no money, no idea, and no memory of who she is, where she was going, or what she might have done. She's assigned a name and diagnosis by the state. Dissociative fugue, a temporary amnesia that could lift at any moment or never at all. When Dr. Benjamin Strauss invites her to submit herself for experimental observation at his Meadowlark Institute for Memory Research, she feels like she has no other choice. To Dr. Strauss, Wendy is a female body subject to his investigation and control. To Strauss's ambitious student Lizzie Epstein, she's an object of fascination, a mirror of Lizzie's own desires, and an invitation to wonder. Once a woman is untethered from all past and present obligations of womanhood, who is she allowed to become? To Alice, the daughter she left behind, Wendy Doe is an absence so present it threatens to tear Alice's world apart. Through their attempts to untangle the mystery of Wendy's identity, as well as Wendy's own struggle to construct a new self, Wasserman has crafted a jaw-dropping, multi-voiced journey of discovery, reckoning, and reclamation. Searing, propulsive, and compassionate, mother-daughter, widow-wife is an ambitious exploration of selfhood, from an expert and enthralling storyteller. Brian Castleberry is nominated for Nine Shiny Objects. Custom House published that book in, on June the 30th last year. Brian is an assistant professor of English. He teaches creative writing at William & Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. He has published a lot of short fiction, short stories in various journals, and now comes with his first novel, Nine Shiny Objects. June 26, 1947. Headlines across America report the sighting of nine pulsating lights flying over the Cascade Mountains at speeds surpassing any aircraft. In Chicago, inspired by the news, Oliver Danville, a failed actor, now reduced to a mediocre pool hustler, hitchhikes west on a fever dream quest for a possible sign from above that might illuminate his true calling. A chance encounter with Saul Penrit, an Idaho farmer, and his family sets in motion the birth of the Seekers a collective of outcasts, interlopers, and idealists devoted to creating a society where divisions of race, ethnicity, and sexuality are a thing of the past. When Claudette Donan, a waitress on the lamp from her suffocating family, encounters the group, she is compulsively drawn to Oliver's sister Eileen, but before she is able to join the enigmatic community, it has vanished. Reunited across the country, the Seekers attempt to settle in the suburbs of Long Island. One night, their purpose suddenly revealed, a stranger emerges and a horrific crime ensues. In the decades that follow, the perpetrators, survivors, and their children will be forced to face the consequences of what happened, a reckoning that will involve Charlie Rannigan, a traveling salesman, Max Felt, a dissolute late 1960s rock star, Alice Linwood, an increasingly paranoid radio host, Stanley West, a struggling African-American poet, Marley Feltberg, a Greenwich Village painter, and Debbie Vasquez, a Connecticut teenager trapped by an avalanche of midnight legacies. Each will prove to be a piece of a puzzle that, when assembled, reveals the shocking truth about the clash between the optimism of those who seek inspiration from spacious skies and the venom of others who relish the underworld, not only via conspiratorial maneuverings, but the literal unearthing of the dead. The result is one of the most exciting and unforgettable debut novels in recent memory and the launch of a major career in American letters. Daniel Evans is um, the second author who is a former five under 35 author. She has written The Office of Historical Corrections, a novella and stories published by Riverhead on November 10th in 2020. He, she, is, she has an MFA from the very famous uh, Writers, I know was writer workshop, which I have read many writers off from who have uh, got degrees from this workshop, and she currently teaches at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. She's widely acclaimed for her blistering smart voice and X-ray insights into complex human 
relationships. Evan zooms in on particular moments and relationships in our characters' lives in a way that allows them to speak to larger issues of race, culture, and history. She introduces us to black and multiracial characters who are experiencing the universal confusions of lust and love and getting walloped by grief, all while exploring how history haunts us personally and collectively. Ultimately, she provokes us to think about the truths of American history, about who gets to tell them, the cost of setting the record straight. And boys go to Jupiter, a white college student tries to reinvent herself after a photo of her in a Confederate flag bikini goes viral. And Richard of York gave battle in vain, a photojournalist is forced to confront her own losses while attending an old friend's unexpectedly dramatic wedding. And in the eye-opening title novella, a black scholar from Washington, D.C. is drawn into a complex historical mystery that spans generations and puts her job, a love life, and her oldest friendship at risk. Steve Wiegenstein is, has written uh, a book called Scattered Lights with short stories. He grew up in the Ozarks, which is the place where one of my favorite Netflix shows is situated. You might have seen the Ozarks. Beautiful story. I just love it. Um, he went to the University of Missouri and uh, his collection... Um, of short stories is called Scattered Lights. This collection of stories brings together a white cast of characters, all connected to the Ozarks. Natives and transplants, young and old, wicked and innocent, troubled and happy, God-haunted and just plain haunted. These stories range over human experience from madness to reconciliation and everything in between, told in precise, poetic language that leaves a permanent impression. Then we have Disha Filio. I talked about Disha in my review of her short story, of her beautiful short story collection, The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. She is nominated for this book, which I won't talk so much about. I put a link up there so you can see the review that I did of this short story collection without many spoilers. And the 10th and final author nominated for the Penn Faulkner Award in 2021 is uh, ya Giazi for Transcendent Kingdom, published by Alfred A. Knopf on September 1 of 2020. Ya Giazi uh, is the third author of the 5 Under 35 from the National Book Award Foundation. Her first novel, Homegoing, was published in 2016, won a couple of awards, and got her even this uh, nomination for the 5 Under, for as 5 Under 35. And now she's nominated for Transcendent Kingdom. As a child, Gifty would ask her parents to tell the story of their journey from Ghana to Alabama, seek an escape in myths of heroism and romance. When her father and brother succumb to the hard reality of immigrant life in the American South, their family of four becomes two and the life Gifty dreamed of slips away. Years later, desperate to understand the opioid addiction that destroyed her brother's life, she turns to science for answers. But when her mother comes to stay, Gifty soon learns that the roots of their tangled traumas reach farther than she ever thought. Tracing her family's story through continents and generations will take her deep into the dark heart of modern America. Transcendent Kingdom is a searing story of love, loss, and redemption, and the myriad ways we try to rebuild our lives from the rubble of our collective pasts. These were the 10 books nominated on the long list for the Penn Faulkner Award of 2021. Please drop a comment down below if you have read one of these books and maybe a different book than The Secret Lives of Church Ladies and tell me if, how you liked it. Uh, the shortlist is coming, I think, in March and the prize, the award, uh, the Penn Faulkner Award, which gives $16,000 for the winner, will be announced in April, but they haven't said yet on which day in April. Thanks for watching this video. Um, stay safe at home, wear a mask, socially distance, talk to other people online, wherever you are, and don't meet so much people in person right now. It's too dangerous. Thanks very much for watching this. Have a great, great day and bye-bye.